welcome to our Biz Huddle podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Cuthbert, Creative Director at Baker Creative. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please hit subscribe so you can get notified when new content comes out. Please share this with anyone who could be inspired by it. Melissa Miller is a professor of political science at Bowling Green State University and affiliated faculty in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexual Studies. She was named a master teacher, the university's highest teaching award, and a distinguished faculty lecturer. Melissa earned a bachelor's degree from Cornell University, a master's from Harvard University, and a doctorate in political science from Northwestern University. She's considered an expert on American politics. Welcome, Melissa. So welcome, Melissa. Thanks for being on our podcast. It's great to be here, Michelle. We're really excited to have you. We're excited about the documentary. There's so much we have to talk about. I'm a professor of political science at Bowling Green State University and executive producer and director of Trailblazing Women in Ohio Politics by WBGU PBS. Why was this project important? This project is so important because yet today, despite being 50% of the population, women are nowhere near parity when it comes to being elected to public office. So women today are 28% of the Congress and about 33% of state legislatures. And boy, it's taken forever to get that far. So what this project does, it was really preserves the stories of women who blazed a trail for women of today and girls of today to run for political office. They began running for office in the late 1960s, 1970s and some in the early 80s when there were so few women candidates. And I think today we don't really bat an eye if a woman is running for a school board, certainly, or city council. Even now we've had multiple women run for president um, and a couple of, you know, very, a very high profile race by Hillary Clinton, of course. Um, But Back then, when these women started running in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, they were treated as novelties on the campaign trail. And they really had to fight to be taken seriously, to be covered by the press. And yet the women featured in this film, they persisted. And some of them lost races along the way and yet managed to break barriers. Our film features the first speaker of the Ohio House, who was a woman, the first woman Ohio Attorney General, the first African-American woman in the Ohio House and Senate, uh, as well as the first African-American woman to be lieutenant governor in all 50 states. That's sort of a fun fact that viewers will learn in the film, that Ohio boasts the first African-American woman lieutenant governor in all 50 states. So their stories are compelling and they're interesting, and I think viewers will really enjoy the film. How did you decide who was going to be in it? One of the decisions we made at the outset of the project was that this is going to be a bipartisan film. And not only is that just in the spirit of WBGU PBS and Bowling Green State University, but also when you think of women running in the 60s and the 70s, it wasn't about party for them. It was about the fact that they were a woman or they were a woman of color. And I knew from the research that I've been doing at Bowling Green State University over the years on women in politics, that a lot of those barriers uh, back when these women were running really transcended party. So party gatekeepers, the political gatekeepers in both parties in those days were really reluctant to put women on the ballot and often would steer them into elections that frankly they would probably lose. So you you think about a race um, for a legislative district that is, you know, predominantly Republican. Well, a Democrat's never going to win that race. And this is what party gatekeepers often steered women into those races or, or talked them into running for a lower level race. And there was a lot of research that I'm familiar with and some of that research I've done to know that these women's experiences really cross party lines and the challenges that they faced. What's so cool about this project is that it's based on really solid research in political science about women's experiences, but it's told in their own words. And that was one of the real treats for me. 
I was familiar with the fact that women back in those days, not today, but back in those days, had a harder time being taken seriously, a harder time raising money and the like. And when we sat down to interview these women, they told about those experiences in their own words, and there's just really no substitute for it. And it's just so compelling and interesting. What was the biggest challenge doing this? If you think about it, were this film about somebody like Nancy Pelosi, even Sarah Palin, other really high profile women who've really made a name for themselves on the national level, doing the research and finding all the visual images to accompany the telling of their story would have been easy. The women we're looking at rose to great heights in Ohio politics, but we really dug deep into the local newspapers from the 60s and the 70s when they first ran, maybe for city council or school board in small towns in many cases. So digging up that research and those archival photos, that was a challenge, but I was so pleased to do that alongside a team of undergraduate and graduate student researchers here at Bowling Green State University who helped with that process. Honestly, it couldn't have been have been completed without the help of about a dozen BGSU students. So some of the research was a challenge because we wanted to make the story visually compelling. And boy, we ended up with some really great images. We've got beehive hairdos in the film and, and just some really good footage of these women when they were not known. One of them rose to become treasurer of the United States. Another is the longest serving woman in the U.S. House of Representatives. But where they came from and what their childhood was like, not unlike a lot of what the viewers upbringing um, it has been like. So what do you see, you know, when you've looked at all these women, what do you think it was the, the biggest thing for them to overcome? What kind of trends did you see in the in the research? People doubted them. Honestly, they had a lot of naysayers. I mean, in here, looking back, it's like, holy cow. You know, one of our trailblazers, Mary Ellen Withrow, became the treasurer of the United States. And yet um, she really had to fight for it. And she had to get out there. And she actually ran in the late 60s telling people, I'm the woman on the ballot. I'm the only woman on the ballot. So she actually sort of embraced I'm the woman and that's why you should vote for me. I cannot tell you how unusual that was at that time when there were so few women running. We had other women who were literally told, you can run, but you'll never win. And, you know, you think that voters are really going to vote for a woman for county prosecutor? Really? I mean, this is the kind of pushback women would get, some of it from like party leaders and some of it from voters themselves. We had women in the film. Um, not all of them had children, but Mary Ellen Withrow, for instance, who became U.S. Treasurer, had four children. And she says in the film that people said, how are you going to raise your four children if you run, right? So it was, you know, things that you don't really hear anymore today, at least not out in the open. Questions like that um, were just kind of run-of-the-mill stuff that these women encountered on the campaign trail. And what's unbelievable is that they didn't quit, you know, and some of them even, they ran and maybe did lose a race here and there. And yet they just kept going and um, really broke barriers and became firsts for women in a number of different ways. I think it is a true testament to resilience overall. I absolutely agree. It is a testament to resilience. And I got to tell you, Michelle, there were times in this project when I needed to dig deep for resilience um, because I'm, you know, a political scientist by training. I am working on a documentary film with WBGU PBS, our amazing on-campus public television station. But man, it's a lot of work. And so when I would get incredibly tired or think, I, I just, I don't know how to, you know, how I'm going to get through this or meet this deadline or what have you, I would think if they can do it, I can do it, right? 
Nancy Hollister, when she first ran for city council, describes being very pregnant. And she had her baby on Memorial Day and won her election to city council in November. If she can do that, I can get this film made and I can do it with a great team at WBGU PBS. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So then how did you end up studying gender in politics to begin with? That's a great question. So I've always been a political junkie. I think a lot of political scientists, particularly those of us who study American politics, you know, it comes from always wanting to watch every political convention on TV, following the news, being on that high school debate team, you know, that kind of stuff. I always did that, that sort of stuff. Um, and found my way eventually um, to getting the PhD. It was something I always knew I wanted to do, but I kind of wove, which is interesting because one of our trailblazers, Joanne Davidson, come to think of it, first woman speaker of the Ohio House, but she said, women tend to weave in their careers. It's totally what I did. Um, but when I decided to get my PhD, I wrote my dissertation um, on civic groups and people's membership in voluntary organizations, everything from the League of Women Voters to um, softball clubs, churches, just any kind of like neighborhood groups, um, Rotary, think of all those organizations, book clubs of all different types. That's what my dissertation was about. And it was about the extent to which that kind of involvement in local groups is actually good for democracy, because it kind of teaches you like, hey, you got to do a fundraising fundraiser. Doesn't that sound like politics? Boy, our group needs to elect officers. Doesn't that sound like a legislature, right? So I studied this. And what happened is one of the chapters was devoted to the biases built in to many civic organizations. And it turns out, according to the data, that even in places like churches, women tend to do a lot of work as volunteers in their churches. They're teaching Sunday school. They're bringing the covered dishes to the potlucks and all that good stuff, but they don't end up being the president of that church council or the, uh, you know, even elected to the church council. So I write this chapter about the fact that women and people of color tend to have less opportunities in civic organizations um, to really kind of rise to the top and, and get in a position where somebody in the community would say, hey, you know, why don't you run for city council or maybe you'll run for school board. I published that work and honestly, it was my favorite chapter of the dissertation, not because of the bias that it demonstrated happens, but because it, I found it so compelling. And that led to me teaching a class here at Bowling Green State University called Women in American Politics, my favorite class to teach. I mean, they're kind of all my favorites, but that one is like really my favorite. And I started to really immerse myself in the literature on women running for political office and particularly the kinds of press coverage women receive. So I did a study in 2008, both about Hillary Clinton's press coverage when she ran for president and Sarah Palin's press coverage when she ran for vice president. And both of them, they definitely got press coverage that was gendered. It wasn't it wasn't compatible with the kinds of coverage. They got loads of coverage. So that wasn't a problem. But it was gendered in ways that are problematic, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Um, and that really has just spawned this really career that's been devoted to looking at issues that pertain to women in politics. Do you think women today could avoid some of those negative stigmas? Oh, I think women have come so far. We don't necessarily see it in terms of the numbers. All right. So we still see Congress is only 28 percent women. It's not, however, that people won't vote for a woman, okay? So let's be clear on that. I like to say in my class, and scholars like myself who study this like to say, when women run, women win. Try saying that five times fast, it's really hard. But when women run, women win. It's not like it was back in the 60s or even earlier when it was 
um, kind of like a strike against you to have a woman's name on the ballot. Like that was hard to get voters convinced to vote for you. That is not true. So if you look at the studies and now this is like mass data that's brought to bear on this, that look at races all across the country. And when you control for level of office and the party, and you control for whether the candidate is an incumbent or not, women have equal win, win rates as men. Why do you have to control for that stuff? Because an incumbent, whether they're a man or a woman, will always have an enormous advantage. You also have to control for the party because there are certain districts, for instance, in you know, in certain uh, parts of Ohio, they're drawn to elect a Democrat or they're drawn to elect a Republican. That's true in pretty much all 50 states. So you have to control for things like party and whether they're an incumbent. But Women have equal win rates and their fundraising is right there. It's equal. There's no significant difference these days. I think the battle for women now is running in the numbers that men run in. And so, you know, a lot of I've, I've heard a lot of women say it, members of the women, members of the U.S. Senate. I've heard them quoted as saying, you know, men, um, they'll look in the mirror and think, I could be president of the United States one day. And fewer women see that. Now, more do today than when you and I were like, you know, growing up, that's for sure. Um, but I think we have a pipeline problem um, in terms of there need to be more women willing to take risks and run. And that's why this film, I think, is so great, because it really is inspiring. And you learn these women like one grew up on a farm. Right. And and um, one grew up here in northwest Ohio and went to high school here in Bowling Green, which is a wonderful high school. But, you know, they weren't necessarily they weren't born into privilege, right? Um, and they just had, you know, regular, you know, Midwest upbringings, and they went on to really break barriers for women in in elective office. So, looking to the future of women in politics, do you see any trends that are emerging? I think there's so much more interest um, among women than we've seen in the past to get involved. And that really, some of a lot of it does date to the 2016 election. So we saw a record number of women run for Congress in 2018, as well as lower level of offices, and a record number of women were elected. So I perhaps being, you know, I have always thought I was like a glass half full person, but maybe I was a little glass half empty because I thought, oh goodness, are we going to see, you know, is that it? Are we going to have that nice 2018 peak in the number of women running? And you know what happened in 2020? Again, it was another record year. And so I think both parties are now recruiting women, more women to run. That used to be the Democratic Party did a somewhat better job recruiting women to run. And here I'm talking sort of like if you look at the national data, right? And the Republican Party, I think, has um, also begun to see women as um, viable on the ballot. Now, in both cases, right, you got to get through the primaries. So we still see some unevenness in in getting women elected. But I think um, it's it's both parties are well aware that women can win elections and women voters have really gotten the attention of the political parties. You know, it wasn't until what was it? 92, I think, was like the first presidential race when there was this awakening to these soccer moms, right? Now, we could say in some ways it's not necessarily that great because not every mom is a soccer mom and not every woman is a mom, right? So, but like that was kind of the first election where the parties kind of went after women as a voting block in their own right. And then we had security moms after 9-11, um, this notion that there were there were women voters out there who could swing an election. And so that's that's really something of the recent past. And I don't think the parties are going to 
um, you know, so I would go back to the old days when women were not seen as a powerful voting block that can swing elections. And I think that's just going to be part of our future. And what I'd like to see, you didn't ask me this, Michelle, but I'm going to throw this in. I definitely want to see more women run on both sides of the aisle. That's how you get to parity. That's how you get women voices at the table from all over the political spectrum. And that is, you know, that that's a, a good because women do bring, and we hear in the film, one of our trailblazers in the film, she introduced the bill in the Ohio legislature. Now this is years ago, but there was a time when insurance companies wouldn't pay for breast cancer screening for women. It was not covered. And her bill, which she had to introduce it two or three times, it's thanks to Helen Rankin, the first African-American woman in the Ohio uh, House and Senate, that mammography was covered, screening mammography was covered for women. So it makes a difference when you have women at the table. And so what I hope is that people will see the film or they'll hear us talking, right? And they'll think I could run, or they might think this is fine with me as well. They think, I know somebody who'd be really good. I'm going to encourage her to run. Because women tend to underestimate themselves and their abilities, and they need that encouragement. And a number of women in our film, they got started because a teacher said, why don't you run for school board? Or an attorney or member of the legislature said, have you ever thought about running for county prosecutor? That, by the way, was at a time when there had never been a county prosecutor in Ohio that was a woman. Betty Montgomery, who I'm proud to say is an alum of Bowling Green State University, I'll throw that in. Uh, but she became not just the first woman county prosecutor in Ohio, but Ohio's first woman attorney general and Ohio's first woman auditor. And, you know, would she have run if somebody hadn't recruited her to run? Maybe not. A lot of these women said politics wasn't really on my radar. So I like to put politics on women's radar and like get them thinking about seeing themselves in office because women have a lot to offer. Oh, absolutely. So looking at all these different women uh, historically, uh, what's the biggest mistake you saw a lot of women leaders make today? They underestimate their abilities. I think there are loads of women who are leaders in their communities. They're leaders in their school or their church, or they're doing something in the neighborhood, or they're organizing the community around something. I mean, it may be, let's have dedicated bike lanes, right? I mean, it can be any number of things, and they don't see that as this is really um, experience that I have that qualifies me to serve more formally in public life and run for office. And so um, I think that's the biggest mistake that women make when it comes. And, and one of the reasons why we just, there aren't that many women who run. There's still, even though we've broken records in terms of seeing women run in the very recent past, they're still dwarfed by the number of men who run. So I think women should just, you know, and also be willing to take a risk. So don't discount your qualifications. Have you led a committee in your church? Have you ever, you know, been the leader uh, of a civic club or organization? Have you organized, you know, your neighbors to do something about the broken street lamp or what have you, or the trash pickup? These are the kinds of things that, you know, they are, you have been engaged. And so don't sell yourself short. Women have so many great skills. And, and I think a lot of us do underestimate our own abilities. And so we don't see politics or think, oh, I'm not qualified. You probably are a lot more qualified than you think. Now, what men have supported you in this project? There've been a number of men who supported our trailblazers, and I'll start with that. So we have stories from some of our trailblazers, uh, Mary Ellen Withrow, who became U.S. treasurer. Her husband always encouraged her, and she says in the film, another man would get in the race, and I'd get so nervous, and my husband would say, you don't think you could beat him, right? So, so there, I think, are men behind the scenes that viewers will hear about in the film. I also want to give a shout out to my late husband, Neil Engelhart. 
Um, he was a political scientist like myself here at Bowling Green State University. And he was the first person I went to with this idea um, to actually partner with WBGU PBS and make a film about trailblazing women in Ohio politics. And he's like, sure, sounds like a great idea. He didn't, he didn't even, he was like, yeah, give him a call. That, you know, don't you know people over there, Melissa, you can, you can, they've interviewed you on their public affairs program. Give them a call. And so I did, right? Well, then as chair of political science, there were, you know, some technical things about like, how would I, how could I get a huge amount of research done? Um, and, you know, he encouraged me to apply for different grants and funding and th that, I just cannot tell you how supportive he was. And unfortunately he died before um, he could see the end result. Part of me is thinking, would he believe it that we actually got, <laughs> right? I think he would, I think he had faith in me, but he died in early 2020. Um, and so, you know, and that's another thing. Um, the project took longer to finish than we thought in part that was due to COVID, of course. So many things slowed down and I had to gear back up again, to be honest. Um, but this project was an enormous motivator for me to gear back up, to see it through. We already had one interview on tape and I thought, pre-COVID. And I thought, I can't now not finish this because, you know, my personal life kind of got run off the rails there. I laugh now, it's not funny, but humor I find is a great way to deal with grief. And so it really gave me something to pour myself into that because it was at the stage of doing now intensive research on all of these women and actually in partnership with WBGU making a documentary film. It wasn't something that I'd ever done before. So while it started while my husband was still alive, it wasn't, it didn't bring back memories. This was all something new. This was, I can go on and, you know, I can still accomplish things and I can sort of, you know, get up, stand on two feet and, uh, and move on. And so I will tell you this, my two boys and I have two teenage sons. They've become my, you can do it mom kind of supporters. <laughs> and so, you know, I forget how often we turn to like a spouse or a partner for all those little things like, oh my goodness, you know, this is hard. And how am I going to get through this? Or how am I going to make, you know, or, you know, and my husband always filled that role. Now I've got two teenage sons, Andy and Nathan, and they've filled their dad's shoes in that respect. And I thank them for that. And, um, you know, they've seen me at the laptop for countless hours or, oh my gosh, I've got to answer this call. It's a trailblazer. Right. And so they've, they've been right there for me and that's been terrific. Well, my condolences, I'm sorry to hear about that, but it was how wonderful for you to have a partner that was so supportive. I totally agree. And then he, by the way, was chair of the Department of Political Science. And so after he died, one of my colleagues, Mark Simone, took over the chair role and he served as chair before. So he was super well qualified to step in. And he and the rest of my department have been so supportive. Um, and just, um, you know, just even asking about how's it going, you know, on that project. And I think, you know, one of the things maybe we learned this during COVID, it is so important to reach out to each other and encourage each other in whatever that endeavor your family member or your colleague might be doing or a neighbor. And I I have felt such great support from Mark Simone, the chair of the department, Shannon Orr. I got to give her a shout out and I'll quickly mention this. Um, after my husband died, I knew that I was going to have to get this project up and running again. And that was hard. And I had a colleague, Dr. Shannon Orr, who's also a friend, and I was going on sabbatical and it had been arranged before my husband died. To be honest with you, did I really want to take a sabbatical? 
you know, sort of like, what would that have been six months after he died? I didn't really want to take a sabbatical. I felt like it's not really good for me to not have my classes to teach and write all this stuff to do, but you can only, I, I delayed it by one semester and you can't just keep delaying it. So my friend, Shannon, my colleagues said, why don't we zoom once a week so that the two of us can, you know, hold each other accountable. She wasn't on sabbatical, but she'd been on sabbatical before and she knew the risk is, you know, do you get as much accomplished on sabbatical with your research agenda as you want? And so she said, let's Zoom once a week. So we Zoomed and there was another project I was working on that I had to finish up first, but we Zoomed once a week and I would say to her, I got to get started on trailblazing women. I got to restart, if you will. And um, she was a great sounding board. I'm like, I don't, Shannon, I don't know how I'm going to do all this research because you need to get students to help you. And then it was like, oh, of course, like, I, I think part of it, I was kind of in this malaise brought on by personal tragedy, um, but she encouraged me. I applied and, and um, applied for a grant. She read it and gave me feedback. So women supporting women, she helped me over a, um, a personal and a professional hurdle. And I have to say, you know what she, why she wanted to have these Zoom meetings? Because she had a big project. She wanted to um, found, she wanted to establish a food pantry on the BGSU campus. This is a problem that's not unique to BGSU. It is nationwide, but there are students who don't have enough food to eat and, and they're paying to go to college, maybe paying themselves. They don't have the money. And she not only um, in these Zoom meetings, like, so we were helping each other, encouraging each other. She now launched a food pantry that opened last year on the campus. And she last week was named to a national council on food insecurity. I mean, that she is phenomenal. So she inspired me as well. Oh, I love that. That's wonderful. Yeah. So my last question is, when it's all said and done and you retire, what kind of legacy do you want to leave? That's so hard because I... Um, I get so caught up in what I'm doing right in the moment. Okay, so I will tell you that I want to inspire women. Sometimes people have asked me, Michelle, they've said, why don't you run for office? Have you ever thought of running for office? You should run. I once got a student evaluation. The first time I taught women in American politics, that class, I kept it. This was back when they were on paper and pencil. And it was very nice. And it had lots of comments. I loved this class, you know, um, which I was certainly pleased to hear. But I laughed. It said, Dr. Miller for president, exclamation point. And I thought, you know what? I've that. It, I'm never running for president, let's just say. Like, I mean, that's not happening, obviously, right? But I thought, it's working, right? Like, it's working. They're feeling, they're seeing something. I mean, to think that they could, you know, I, I think it was said in jest, but it's kind of like, look, women can do things. Women can, you know, they can strive. We can inspire other women. And, and one of the reasons why, I haven't run for public office is because I want to lift all women. And I had to make a decision. I love American politics, but I had to decide, am I going to go the route that's more like I'm going to be an activist or am I going to go the academic route? And I wanted to do the academic route because I, I really love studying this stuff. I love the research. But what that means is I think people like me, and this goes for educators in all subjects from K through 12, through university education, through college education, um, we don't realize that we can inspire women. And I I see myself, I end every class, even not my in my other classes, uh, I teach political parties and voter behavior. I say, think about running. Why do we cede that to somebody else? And then we all complain, not enough good people run for office. Think about running. Don't underestimate yourself. I say I say this to the men and women in my classes. And um, I recently had a woman run for 
uh, a D, uh, one for office and win in DC. And um, now I'm going to be embarrassed because I can't remember. DC has a slightly different structure, you know, because it's it's federal, right? It's it's um, it's not a state, and it's like a neighborhood council sort of office. I was so pleased, and I've had other women and men run and win um, that you know I had as students when I you know as early as late you know, late 2000s. And I feel like that's my contribution. That's my legacy. I want to inspire people to either run or encourage somebody to run, get involved in your communities, make a difference that way. And I think I want that to be my legacy. I think it's a great legacy. Sounds like you kind of walk, walk along what you believe in, right? I really, I really do. And I've always been um, a moderate and politically. So it's not like, oh, I don't have any political beliefs. I mean, everybody, you know, you have to be totally checked out. But what my research is about, it's about all women. It's about, right? It's about trying to elevate and encourage women to run and be part of the scholarship and the understanding of women's experiences. What's so cool. And I just, I was like, I feel like I'm a kid in the candy store, (laughs) right? I really do. I had a trailblazer um, after the interview, she said, I said, you know, do you have any pictures? Would you have any pictures or old memorabilia? And she said, well, it's funny you asked, because I was looking at some of that last night. So she goes out to her, I think she'd put it maybe on the dining room table. And she comes back with these two giant stacks of like scrapbooks. And we start looking at it and we both just get to laughing. And, and I literally, I kid you not, I was like a kid in a candy store looking at this memorabilia and just, this is, it's amazing right? And also I'm kind of a visual person. I'm a visual learner. So I was really, I so wanted this documentary not to be visually boring and boy, it's not, it's like full of images and Caitlin Cook Finkler and Megan Murray, the editor and uh, producer and editor respectively did a beautiful job with a lot of this memorabilia that we collected and we got it on film. And um, so it's visually interesting, but the whole project has been like, I'm a little worried, Michelle, what am I going to (laughs) do after this is over? I still have some work to do. The film is out there. It's amazing. Um, You and I have been working on the website for the project, which features not just the trailblazers in the film, but an additional four trailblazers. And and now until you mentioned my retirement, that's a little ways off. Um, But I'm going to be collecting more interviews because it's an embarrassment of riches. There are more trailblazers than we could put in one film. And so I'm going to continue to interview women who've broken barriers in Ohio politics, make their stories sound bites from their interviews available to the public and to teachers. If there are any, like, if any listeners to this podcast, like know an educator, send them to BG, you know, what is it? www.bgsu.edu slash trailblazers, because there's a heck of a lot of good content that you can use to teach um, middle school and high school and, and college students about the experience of women. And you know, one other thing I'll say is there are going to be films and there are going to be books written about the Nancy Pelosi's and the Hillary Clinton's of the world. And given their accomplishments, of course, we would expect that. What's so cool about this project is that, you know, a lot of people, you know, they may be inspired by Nikki Haley or back in 2008, so many people found Sarah Palin's story and she had, you know, a family and an infant. And, and, and so these women who really become household names at the national level, yes, they're inspiring. But I think for a lot of women, they can't see themselves reaching maybe not quite that level. That's okay. Look at these women who made a name in state and local politics, made a difference in state and local politics. Um, And I really like that we're shining light on 
not just the household names in American politics, these women in American politics, but some names that deserve to be household names. Agreed. Well, thank you so much for being on our podcast. It's been great. I love working with you throughout this project and to just like now both of us like take a breather and just chat about it is fun. It's super fun for me. Well, same for us. Thank you so much. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please hit subscribe so you can get notified when new content comes out. Please share this with anyone who could be inspired by it and feel free to post any questions so we can be inspired by new content. Thanks for listening. If you're interested in learning more, visit our website at bakercreative.co.